We've been hoping to have this conversation for a long time. You've made so much progress as one of the lead investors in PG&E's restructuring. I wonder, could it all unravel because of the coronavirus pandemic and the impact it's having on credit markets? Well, it's a good question, but thankfully the company worked hard to secure all of its financing uh, going back over the course of the last number of months, both from banks uh, as well as a supportive group of bondholders that were willing to lock in financing for the company so that it would have that portion of the bankruptcy really secured. And that coupled with an equity backstop from a group of shareholders and other interested parties has allowed the company to have a certainty to achieve exit once uh, two remaining important pieces of the case are resolved. First, the uh, approval of the CPUC uh, in California for the company's restructuring plan and its go-forward uh, operational plan, as well as the vote from the victims, uh, you know, saying that they approve their treatment in the plan. So those are the two last pieces of the puzzle, and uh, both appear to be well on track. I definitely want to get to that question about the wildfire victims, but before I do, Tom, it was my understanding, and I could be wrong, that some of the financing still needs to be put in place, and there are some deadlines for that in August, September maybe, and the end of the year. So the, the, the deadlines that you're referring to, I believe, relate to uh, exiting from bankruptcy, meaning finalizing the company's exit uh, in order to satisfy the victim's trust by August. They have a right, uh, but not an obligation, to walk away from their deal if we're unable to secure the exit before uh, late August. Uh, the governor's office would like to see the company emerge from bankruptcy by the end of December. Uh, but in both cases, the financing that needs to be secured is really converting uh, bridge financing for a small portion of the company's capital structure from the banks into more permanent financing. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly the company could exit with the bridge financing and then uh, finance that out at a point in time later. I think looking at the utility sector writ large, um, that portion of our market has calmed down quite significantly quite significantly over the course of the last few weeks if we look back to you know when a lot of these deals were cut uh, la late last fall uh, the S&P uh, has declined rather precipitously but the utility index over that period of time is only down about 7% if we look from sort of November mm -hmm. 1st forward so we've seen a great deal of recovery in that sector and the financing markets are certainly open for investment grade rated bonds as we've all seen recently. Tom, you alluded to the bad blood between the company, its investors, and the wildfire victims. The victims are getting some of their $13.5 billion settlement in the form of PG&E stock. And I know you're aware they're concerned, Knighthead and potentially other hedge funds uh, that own PG&E stock and have been very active in the restructuring process are going to dump their PG&E shares as soon as they can. Uh, that would depress the value of the shares that the victims hold and potentially reduce their recovery over time. Is there anything you or other investors are prepared to do to, uh, to soothe those concerns? Well, the, the number one thing that's been done is the value at which the victims are receiving their stock is at a substantial discount to uh, the, where utilities trade in the U.S. today. Even after uh, all of the turbulence in the market, the value at which the victims are receiving their stock is still about a 20 percent discount to where the utility index on a comparable basis trades. And importantly, PG&E has a much faster growth rate uh, than most other utilities. In fact, if you look at it as compared to the other large utilities in the United States, PG&E actually has the fastest earnings growth rate among those comparables. So from a fair value perspective, the stock is being granted at a substantial discount. Um, I don't think there's, you know, the stock in PG&E trades every day. Uh, you have new buyers and sellers emerging on a regular basis. So the idea that everybody will suddenly turn around and sell all of their stock at the same time is inconsistent, I think, with how these investors approach this situation over a long period of time and certainly uh, inconsistent with selling something well below fair value. Tom, we could talk about PG&E forever. It's such a fascinating case. Uh, I do want to ask you some questions about what's happening right now in credit markets and how it applies to you and your firm, Nighthead. How much money have you put to work since the beginning of March? We came into this with roughly a billion dollars in dry powder. We've put uh, a little more than half of that to work over the course of the last number of weeks. I think we're taking a, 
you know, a modestly aggressive approach. But, uh, you know, in looking at how the markets have evolved, which is typical for these types of situations, when you have severe shocks in the marketplace, you know, the initial investments that we were making were in very, very safe investment grade rated credit or very, very high rated uh, non-investment grade rated credit companies that would not need to restructure. That will, of course, migrate over time into more typically distressed situations as we take advantage of a broader distressed market that we see emerging. I think the probability of a record-setting number of defaults over the course of the next 12 to 24 months is very, very high, given what you know is occurring in the real economy, uh, which is obviously not something that any of us cheer for, but it is going to create some rather interesting opportunities across a wide swath of sectors in the marketplace. What industries or companies, kinds of companies, let's say, look attractive to you, and what kinds of returns, Tom, do you think you can generate? Well, this is the thing that's really kind of interesting, Eric. When you look at where some of these, uh, you know, relatively low coupon, high quality bonds are trading in the market, you know, in many cases they're trading between 65 and 80 cents on the dollar. And our view is that over the course of the next 12 to 24 months, those securities will normalize and return to, uh, you know, trading in the vicinity of 100 cents on the dollar. So when you look at the combination of your capital appreciation from your purchase price, uh, plus your coupon back to a more normalized state of the world, uh, particularly given how much lower uh, risk-free rates are right now, you know, you're looking at compound returns that are well north of 20 percent, in some cases much higher than that. And these are in industries that I think are, you know, somewhat affected by what's going on right now, but are not like to see permanent impairment. So whether that's, you know, a pipeline business that is, um, you know, that is temporarily impacted as a result of reduced product flows or a consumer products company or a food company that sees some, you know, near-term disruption to their business, but not a permanent impact on their business. Those are really interesting opportunities and the kinds of things that we're focused upon right now. And as I said a moment ago, that, you know, that, that, focus of ours is likely to shift from those types of companies into businesses that will actually need to go through some type of more significant operational or financial restructuring over time.